It's great to be together. We are uh, going to be talking today about the idea of being certain of what we do not see. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might notice that that's a reference back to the scripture I preached on last time. Uh, I do know other scriptures, but, you know, that's, it ties into what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, that, let's go to the reference here of what we're looking at. Hmm. Are we on the end, perhaps? No? Oh, I'm turned off. That's the issue. It's my problem. Okay. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. You know, I don't know how you feel, but I don't like it when I don't know what's going to happen. I like to be able to see what's going to go on and, and know ahead of time what to expect. Uh, but I've noticed that life often doesn't work that way. Um, the last time I spoke, I also had a picture of a mountain, and it looked like this. Now, if I was going to go mountain climbing, I would much rather go in a picture like this than this. Because... This one, I don't know where I'm going or what's happening. The other one, I could stand down there with a pair of binoculars and look the mountain over and kind of figure out, okay, I'm going to go up that way and I'm going to go up that way. Not that my knees would work anyway, but you know, that's my plan. I can see, but this mountain's mysterious. I, you know, I'm not sure I like that very much. And that represents a lot of times what's happening in our life, doesn't it? Amen. So that's what we're going to talk about today is having a faith that allows us to be certain of what we do not see. Here's what we're going to cover. What is it that they or we can't see? Um, that was my biggest surprise takeaway when I was studying for this, is I learned that some of what I had always assumed about this verse was not true, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about the idea of faith or trust and hope and our calling. Um, now, those are all nice words that we like, uh, but oftentimes they're not what we expect, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Most of our time, we're going to talk about what it means to trust or have faith in real life, because I think we're often challenged in our faith and in our trust, and so we're going to look at some key things that will help us to continue to have faith uh, in the face of difficulty. So that's our plan for the day. So let's jump in and talk about what it was that they couldn't see. Here's the way I've always thought about this, this phrase or this verse in the past. When I, when I looked at and thought about the idea of being certain of what we do not see, I automatically went to the things that I would consider universal things. You know, God. I, I don't see God physically, uh, and so... I have to have faith to believe in God, right? Uh, I've not been to heaven, uh, but my, you know, a lot of my life has lived around the idea of trying to get there. That takes faith. And, and so those things are real. I mean, I think that, that this verse applies to those things. You know, I would like the world to make sense. They had the same problem. You wouldn't believe the stuff they went through in their world. I mean, they had... They had persecution, they had difficulty, they had government that didn't make any sense, there was cruelty, uh, there was injustice, uh, you know, there were people who were bad people that were, were getting away with stuff, and people who were good people that were suffering. They had all these things going on in their world. I'm glad we don't have to deal with any of that stuff in our life. But they wanted the world to make sense just like we want it to make sense. Good luck with that. Um, you know, those are universal things that I think require faith. Interestingly, I don't think that's what Hebrews 11 is really talking about. Um, you know, in Hebrews chapter 11, we can, you know, we can turn over there. Uh, we're not going to read the chapter. We did that last time. But if you look at Hebrews chapter 11, the things that they could not see that they had to have faith about was what God had called them to. And it's different for different ones of them. You know, Abraham was told, leave your country and go to another place that I'll show you. And I'm going to give you that place. I'm going to make you a great nation. Amen. 
And yet Abraham didn't have the dirt and he didn't have the offspring. And so he couldn't see that. He could only see that through faith. God goes to Moses and he says to Moses, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go deliver the people of Egypt or the Israel from Egypt. You're going to take them out of Egypt and you're going to lead them to the promised land. I, I guarantee you Moses didn't see that. In fact, he told God repeatedly, I don't know how that's going to happen. I'm not the right guy. Send somebody else. Finally, after interacting with God, he developed a faith that allowed him to be certain of what he could not see. You know, Joseph goes to Egypt. You know, so, sometimes, I don't know if this is an advantage or a disadvantage, you know, Moses gets a lot of the plan up front. You know, Moses gets told, okay, you're going to go to Egypt, you're going to confront Pharaoh, you're going to lead them out, you're going to lead them to the promised land. Uh, you know, that's, maybe that's too much information. Joseph doesn't know what's going on most of the time. He's in Egypt, he, goes, he gets sold into slavery, he gets, he gets put in jail, he goes through all of this stuff, and he has to make his way step by step. It's not until the end that he figures out what's going on, and he says, look, you guys intended to harm me, but God intended to do good. And he saves the nation, he builds, he helps Israel become a great nation in captivity to prepare the stage for Moses later. All of these things that they were called to are the things that they couldn't see that Hebrews 11 is talking about. <clears throat> you know, I, ironically, we talk about, well, when I say certain of what I do not see, I'm talking about God. Some of them actually saw God. <laughs> they just didn't see the plan all the time. Uh, and, and so that's what they were dealing with. Um, they had these specific callings that required faith and that's what they were commended for having. You know, in the, in the New Testament, the followers of Jesus were not given a blueprint. Now, we go back and read what they did, and we try to use what they did as a blueprint. We say, okay, well, they did this, this, and this, so we got to do it that way. And, you know, they had this plan, and they went about this this way, and they, they set up these people to do this job. And, you know, it looks really organized from our perspective because it's already happened. But they were figuring it out as they went. They didn't, they didn't have a blueprint. They had a heading and a relationship. God said, go this way and walk with me, and I'll give you the details as you need them as you go along. That's the way it worked. But they couldn't see what was happening most of the time. What is it that we can't see? When we talk about being certain of what we do not see, what are we talking about? Well, it could be a lot of things. I mean, it's still those universal things. We still need faith to, see, to, to be certain of God and heaven and try to make sense of the world. Those haven't changed. Um, but it's not the same for all of us because our obstacles are different. Um, you know, the, some of us have different challenges. Marriage is a challenge for a lot of people. A lot of people look at their life and they cannot see how they're going to have a great marriage. I read an interesting article uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that was really pretty surprising to me. In this article, it talked about something called gray divorce. Gray divorce. Now, you might figure out what that means. It's talking about divorce in older couples. The divorce rate in people over 50 has doubled in the last 10 years. It's tripled for people over 60. That's shocking. You know, I'm, I'm you know, going all that way and getting to that point in your life and then throwing the towel in. Why does that happen? Because people haven't figured out how to have great marriages. Now, I mean, I think some people have great marriages and I'm glad for them. And, you know, I mean, I love, I love being married to Betsy. Um, so, you know, that's, that's awesome. But a lot of people struggle with that. They can't see that. And they need faith to get there. You know, we, we want our children to flourish, both in life and spiritually. And uh, that's a challenge sometimes. 
You know, sometimes people despair. They're not sure what to do. They don't know how to move forward to help their children. It's something they can't see. They need faith uh, to, to get there. Uh, sometimes, we're, sometimes I, I'll give you a, a clue, sometimes children are trying to figure out their parents too. Um, yeah, the parents can be confusing. Um, but, uh, you know, we, that whole family dynamic can be really difficult, and it requires faith. Um, it's funny, I had these points, and every, all during the service, I'm sitting there, and things are happening in the service. I say, well, you know, that fits right into this point or that point. You know, I think that we want to see the church grow and do well and see people become disciples. You know, and then Randy gets up there and shows a picture of, you know, this room being much more full. But not just having people in the seats. I mean, I think we want to have the ability to help others. And sometimes we're stymied. And we're trying to figure out, how do we, how do we make that happen? How, do, how does that, how do we make that work in our, in our lives? We don't see it. We need faith to get there. I think you'll notice a theme in all of these different things. I think relationships are difficult Amen. for us. And I think that, I think that as I look at the world around us, relationships are becoming more difficult, not easier. It, it's remarkable that when we live in a world that we have the ability to be more connected than ever, or so we think, that people feel more alone than they've ever felt in their marriages, in their families, and in their friendships. I think people desperately need genuine friendships we're somehow losing our ability to cultivate those and nurture those and have them, have them grow the way that they need to. And lastly, we need, a, you know, we need a close relationship with our Creator. And I think that we're constantly barraged with ideas that, that work against that. And, and yet, it's something that all of us feel a need for internally. You know, those, those are just some of them. We could, have, we could put a bunch of other things on this list, but those are some of the things that I think that we can't see, that we have faith, we need to have faith to take hold of. Let, let's talk about this idea of faith and trust and our calling. You know, we, a lot of times, most of the time, we don't know the whole picture. In fact, I'll go out on a limb and say we never know the whole picture, even if we think we do. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, God, what am I supposed to be doing here? And, you know, we don't have all the information. And I think that's on purpose, because God wants us to have faith and to trust him to get there. Um, here, here's the thing. Neither did our faith heroes that we read about in the Bible. You know, you go back to Hebrews 11. We're not, you know, we're going to read there. But when you read through Hebrews chapter 11... What you figure out pretty quickly is most of the time they didn't know what was going on. I mean, even if they had been given a specific job, um, you know, you, you, they didn't always know what was happening. I'm, I'm sure, and I know this from reading about his life, I'm sure if you could have had coffee with Abraham and said, okay, Abraham, what's the plan? He probably would have said, I don't know. If you find out, let me know. You know, he, he went step by step. And even those who knew more of the plan, like Moses, they didn't know how all the details were going to work out. They had a lot of obstacles uh, to overcome. Here, we are called to a relationship, not a specific itinerary. You know, you ever, you ever go on a trip and you get this, you know, you get this breakdown. Um, you know, Betsy and I like to go on cruises, you know, and so they give you this, they give you this planner thing, you know, and they show day one, day two, day three, and, and they, you know, they tell you what to do. And you can schedule these little trips, you know, that you go on when you go ashore and they charge you too much money for them. And, you know, I mean, you got all this stuff. And so it comes out, uh, it comes out, they slide this thing under your door in the morning or they put it on your phone now. They're, they're getting away from the thing. They slide under the door. Uh, but they, they give it to you every day, and here's your itinerary for the day. 
You know, you got this time, you got this event, and this time you got that event, and this event, and you're going ashore here, and you're doing this and doing that, and you got to be back on the ship by this time, or we're going to leave you. I mean, you know, they give you the whole thing. I think sometimes we want our Christianity to work that way. You know what really makes going on a cruise fun, why we enjoy it? It's the company you're with. I, you know, I don't, I enjoy the, the itinerary, especially trivia, but you know, I mean, the main thing is I'm with her. That's what matters. And in life, what matters is that we're with God and that we're, then we work it out from there. Um, you know, God gives us the details when we need them. Turn over to Philippians or you can read it on the screen, either one. This is a fascinating verse to me. This is the Apostle Paul. Okay, so we're, we're dealing with a guy who's got a direct connection, who, was, you know, you, you hear sometimes people talking about when they became a Christian, and they say, oh, who studied the Bible with you? Oh, well, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was JP, or it was this person, or that person. You know, you ask Paul, who studied the Bible with you? Jesus. Yeah. He just came down and visited me directly and taught me directly. Um, you know, he, he had all kinds of direct communication with God. This is his perspective, that guy. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. He was still trying to figure it out. He said, well, God took hold of me for some reason. I haven't quite figured out what it is, but I'm pressing on to try to take hold of whatever that thing is. And I know what direction it's in. It's in the direction towards heaven. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm working and applying effort to take hold of it because I haven't got it yet. You know, that's, that's the way it works. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these circumstances that we're talking about, the people that we admire didn't have it right. You know, Paul was sure that the job that he should do is he should be the, he should go preach to the Jews because he had, I mean, he had a resume, right? I mean, Paul had an impressive resume to reach out to Jews uh, and, you know, he could, he could list it out. Well, you know, I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. They know me. They know my life. They know how I've lived. They'll receive the message from me. And God said, nope, nope, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. <laughs> what? Well, how can I be the apostle to the Gentiles? That's, that doesn't make any sense. God says, no, that's, it's going to work. Trust me. And, and it worked. You know, Moses, Moses thought, okay, I'm going to lead them out and I'm going to take them and we're going to go into the promised land. And God said, no, you're going to stop right here and you're not going to actually go into the promised land. Joshua was going to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I always, I always figured that God figured Moses had had enough <laughs> and he was, he was cutting him a break. Uh, but, you know, that's probably not the way he expected it to work out. They got it wrong all the time. So don't be surprised if you think you've got it figured out and then later you discover you didn't, because that happens to us almost every day. So how do we trust God in real life? Okay, what does faith look like in practice? Now, the reason that I'm preaching on this topic today is a good friend of mine told me these uh, trusting God lessons are okay and they got a lot of inspiration and I'm enjoying them. But we need some practicals to be able to put it into, into effect. So give us some stuff we can hang our hat on that when we're up against it, I can know this is what I need to do if I'm going to have faith in real life. So here you go. There are fundamental things that are critical if we're going to live out our life by faith. And a lot of times, those very things that we need to have faith 
get neglected when they're the most, at, at the most important juncture in our life. So we're going to look at three of them. We could look at more, but we're going to look at three. Fundamental number one, devotion to God's Word. Devotion to God's Word. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Where do we get faith? Faith comes from God's Word. That, it, has that, it has that effect on us. I wish I could explain to you scientifically how that worked. I can't. Um, you know, I mean, it's obviously impressive, and it's, it's, it's great to read the Scriptures. It's compelling. It's convincing, all that kind of stuff. But I don't know that you can, you can explain it all just with that. God's Word has an amazing effect on our heart just from reading it. You know, in Hebrews 4, it says the word is living and active. I think most of us have experienced that. I've seen people that were stone cold atheists that read the Bible. And by the time they were done with a few books in the Bible said, I don't know that I have that much conviction about atheism anymore. I'm going to read more. And some of those people, some of you sitting in this room started out being atheists and you read the Bible and somehow or other you, you said, I, I'm not an atheist anymore. I believe in God. Tell me what I need to do to be a disciple. It just happens. That's where faith comes from is the word of God. But here's the thing. I think we look at that verse most of the time and think about it as describing initial faith. Well, that's how you get enough faith that you can become a disciple is from the Word of God. And, but now we're in the advanced program, and so it doesn't work that way with us anymore. That's not true. I, I, we need the Word of God to inspire faith in us just as much if we've been around for 50 years as if we've been around five minutes. I mean, it's not just for initial faith. It will strengthen our faith as wherever we're at in our journey. And we need that. Um, we need that if we're going to do well. It's an interesting thing when you talk on a regular basis with people who are having a tough time spiritually. Here, here's something that will happen almost every time. You're talking to somebody who says, I'm really struggling in my faith. Ask Ask them this question. How's it going with your Bible study? Oh, it's, well, actually, that's not going very well. Aha. You know, that's, that's part of our problem. Amen. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. You know, it's, uh, if we're in the darkness, that can be frightening. Uh, fear can stop us from moving forward. How does the Bible describe itself? It says it's, it's a light, it's a lamp. You can walk in the light. That will increase your faith if you're getting exposed to the Word of God. Read 1 John chapter 1. We're not going to read it now. That's, that's how it describes the Christian light. Walk in the light as he is in the light. The Word of God will strengthen our faith. Fundamental number two. Prayer instead of worry. Turn to 2 Chronicles. This is too long to go on the screen, so you're going to have to actually flip pages for this one. It won't hurt you any, I promise. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to pick up in verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your, names and bears your name and cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. 
But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, Moab, Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as, a, as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah and their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. You know, they're in a desperate situation. They're, they're outnumbered. They're, they don't have the ability to win this battle. Now, here's what they did have the ability to do. Here's the faithless thing they could have done. They could have, they could have gone into submission to them and paid a tribute and, and surrendered and let them come in, and they could have said, well, what else could we do? We, we weren't in a position to fight, so we had to knuckle under. But that's not what they did. They said, what we need to do is pray. And so they go uh, to where the temple is and stand before God and pray. And God delivered them. Look at Philippians verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. This is uh, one of those preacher verses. Do I have? Nope, I don't have that one on the screen. Verse 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's a great verse. We love that verse when we're not under stress. <laughs> when we're feeling anxious and somebody, you know, you're, if you're in a stressful situation and you're anxious and you're really worried and somebody says, hey, why don't we look at Philippians chapter 4? You're like, oh, I know where you're going. I don't, don't be giving me that verse right now. But that's what God tells us to do. We want peace, uh, but we've got to pray if we're going to have that. Look, all of our faith heroes were devoted to prayer. If you don't believe me, take, take out a piece of paper, write down the name of your top 10 heroes in the Bible. Just put their names on a piece of paper and then read up on them. You'll find out that every one of them prayed fervently. Every single one of them. I don't know of any great character in the Bible that, that didn't pray on a regular basis if, if they did great things for God. Here's my question. When we're under stress, when our faith is challenged, do we turn inward or do we turn upward? Our faith struggles if we shut down and pull inward. And a lot of times that's our natural tendency. And so we've got to fight that uh, in order to continue to have faith in real life. Fundamental number three, community, not isolation. This is, this is an important one. You know, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, usually we talk about this when we're talking about marriage. But it was never a mystery to God. God looked at Adam after he had created him. Now, this is Adam in the Garden of Eden, in paradise, before sin has entered into the world. So, no sin yet, freshly made Adam, and God looks at him and he says, it's not good for him to be alone. That's God's conclusion when he looks at man. He says, it's... It's not the right thing for him to be alone. That's always been the design for us as people. We're not intended to be isolated. That's not how God made us. Faith should be a shared experience. It's not a solitary pursuit. 
So, you know, that's the, way, uh, that's the way we're supposed to function. That's why God gave us the church. The church was always part of the plan from the very beginning. It, it's, it's intriguing. You know, we, we've got God's spirit, right? I mean, we're, we're saved. We've got the Bible. We've got God's spirit. That ought to be enough, shouldn't it? But God said, no, I'm going to put you together in the church. That, that's critically important. And much of the Bible is about relationships. This is a slide from the last time I preached. We're not going to go over this anymore. But these are, these are just some of the things that the Bible teaches us are critical in one another relationships. These are things that are commanded, that we're supposed to be doing. I mean, we, we need love from each other, acceptance from each other. We need to be encouraged and admonished and, and all of those things that are on the that's, that's all part of what the Bible talks about in relationships. It's shocking how, what percentage of the Bible is about relationships. Turn over to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12. We're winding down here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul here talks about the church. We'll pick up in verse 12. It says, Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all of its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, uh, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So the first thing we see is that we all matter. I can't opt out. And sometimes we want to do that. You know, we want to say, well, I'm not very important. Um, You know, I, I... I'm going to opt out. I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to come to church because nobody will really notice. I'm not very important. You know, all the parts are important. That's the message of this. And we've got to stay connected. You know, you ever, you ever go through your house in the night and you didn't want to turn a light on because it's dark, because you don't want to wake up your wife or the kids, and you're going through, and you're familiar with the house. You know the layout of the house. You've got this down. Uh, and so you're going through the house, and you don't have shoes on, and somehow or other that wall sticks out just a little bit farther than you thought it did, and you catch your little toe on the corner. Is that little toe important? <laughs> I promise you, your whole body is thinking primarily about that little toe right at that moment. I mean, the hands jump in to grab it and rub it. The other hand goes over your mouth so you don't scream out. And I mean, the whole, your whole thought process is, man, that hurts. And somehow or other, I got to get that to stop. So the toe is important. Now, here's the thing. Can you... Can you live, can you exist without your little toe? Well, yeah, you, you can. In fact, I have it on good th- authority that some of our members are running around without all their toes. I'm not going to tell you which ones. But, you know, there are some of them floating around in here that don't, don't have ten toes. So, yes, you can exist. But you won't be all that you could be. So it is with us. But here's the flip side of that that maybe is the more important point. The body can exist without the little toe, but how's the little toe going to do without the body? 
That's not going to work. You know, you, you don't see toes wandering around by themselves in the wild. That just doesn't happen. Uh, there's a serious point behind that. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times we look at how important we are to the body and we fail to look at how important the body is to us. You're, we're going to struggle spiritually if we're not connected and we're not going to do well. Let's read on a little bit. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. God has put the body together giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but all of its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Um, you know, we're all important. I can't say I don't need you. And you can't opt out. Here is the modern reality that we're dealing with. We are losing community in the church. That's just, that's just the truth. We're losing community because some peop a lot of times people are, are opting out or we're not, we're not tending to each other the way that we need to. Um, you know, look, I think it's a great thing that we have, we have the live stream thing that we can use. You know, there are people who are, are sick or can't be here because of health reasons. There are people who are out of town for some reason. That, you know, there are a number of circumstances where that, that gives us a connection uh, that we wouldn't have otherwise. And so I'm, I'm glad we have it. You know, I've utilized it, you know, not too, uh, a month and a half ago I had COVID and there I was at home, but I was with you remotely because that was the only way I could do it. So I'm glad that we have it for those circumstances. Um, but a lot of times because we have it, people choose not to be here that could be here. We are making a mistake spiritually if we choose to not connect with the body when we can. Look, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, and, and some, I, I hesitate to say stuff like this sometimes, because I don't want a person who is doing that for good reasons to feel all, you know, all worked up and guilty about it. That's not my point. My point is there's a lot of us that could be here that aren't. And you know, we've got to search our own heart and think about that. You know, that's true on Sunday. On Wednesday night, that's really true. Um, you know, th this room normally does not look like this on Wednesday night. Now, some, some people who are here aren't going to be in town on Wednesday. I get that. You know, you're passing through. I'm glad you're here. But a lot of us are not here on Wednesdays out of choice. When we lose community, our faith weakens. Let, let, me, let me put it to you this way. Church on Wednesday night lasts about an hour. Um, you know, it lasts about an hour. We try to keep it to that out of sensitivity to people. You know, it, we, come, we come into town to shop. We come into town to go to an event, either a sporting event or some other event. We, you know, we come, into a ta we come into town to go to dinner during the course of the week sometimes, or you know, whatever it is we do. You look, at, look at life and the pattern of life. Are we, are we willing to make that sacrifice for other things, but aren't willing to make that sacrifice uh, to, to be at church? I think we have to think about that at a heart level if we're not going to lose community. You know, I, I, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I don't drive at night. And I get that. You know, some of us don't need to be driving at night. So I understand that. 
If I was telling the truth, some of us probably don't need to be driving during the day. Uh, but that's, that's a different sermon. But, you know, I mean, find somebody who is driving at night and say, hey, could you come pick me up and take me to church? Because I don't drive at night. <laughs> my, my friend Alan Lyerly doesn't drive day or night. And yet, how often is he not here? And wouldn't you know, I'm calling him out and he's not here today because there was a <laughs> snafu with his ride. Um, but, you know, he's here all the time. He makes arrangements to be here because it's important to him to be here. Um, it's important to all of us. We need time together. We need to see each other. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to make people feel bad for utilizing the technology when it makes it's the right choice because of whatever. But we, I think we have to evaluate our own hearts and say, am I allowing myself to lose community in a way that's hurting me spiritually? It, it happens, and so we need to think about that. Um, but regard, beyond that, the relationships we have with each other strengthen and buttress our faith. So just to kind of wrap up, if we're going to have faith that works, we first of all have to walk with God. We have to pay attention to our relationship to God, not just our prayer and Bible study, but that heart level relationship that we have with God. We need to find out what God is calling us to, and we need to follow that. We need to be devoted to his word and to prayer. And lastly, we need to stay connected with our brothers and sisters because that will help our faith. All of these things, I promise you, if your faith is struggling, Satan is going to go after these areas to try to weaken your faith and hurt you spiritually. And he'll do the same thing to me. So we've got to fight for these things. I want to close out with this verse. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world even our faith. Let's, let's strengthen our faith, be certain of what we do not see, and trust God, and God will give us the direction we need to get where we need to go. Amen. Amen.